Guru Nation, welcome back to another episode of Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. So we're here shooting with Simon Arkell from Deep Lens. We just did a 10 minute, by the way, a really good 10 minute video on my Patreon channel. That's five bucks a month. We got to shield this Patreon. <laughs> what a deal. <laughs> what a deal, right? I mean, they get to watch your video there. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. Worth five bucks in and of itself? It it's is. worth six. It's worth six. We <laughs> might raise go. the price. We might raise the price, guys. So, Simon Arkell from Deep Lens. We're going to get into what that means, but here's a hint all about data, applications of data, patient recruitment. There's a lot. There's a lot. And then Chris Arbor, of course. The. Uh, co-host and also co-author of our book who many say sounds like Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen. What you keep telling me. Uh, I, I don't hear it. But. Five people have <laughs> mentioned is your co-author Seth Rogen. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways let's talk about deep lens guys because this is important. We're in 2020. This is an important time in the industry. There is a change taking place. When I got into research in 05 the change was we were going from paper CRFs, case report forms. For those that don't know, we used to write down, there was no EDC. We mm -hmm. used to look at the source and write down the data in a big notebook. Then the monitor would come source data verify, rip the page. I know this is, sounds like crazy, like, like stone ages. Mm -hmm. Monitor would come rip the white and yellow and leave the pink. And then they would FedEx these things to data management. And was this was of, like there was no EDC when there was came a lot in. of complaints about EDC when it started yes. breaking in, right? Yes. They didn't want to. They didn't want to transfer from so, paper to. No, electronic. they did not. And mm. the parallels actually, we can talk about that because when I came in '05, I had like four studies with paper CRFs. The next year, there were no no more paper CRFs. But a lot of complaints. A lot of complaints from the older establishment. You know me, right. I didn't care. I was just at a college. I was like, yeah, this is the way it should be done. This is a stupid sure, way to do sense. it. makes more sense. But the old establishment, no, no, what, what's going on? We're going to be replaced. Sure. That, that was, was the so word. Break, They're going to be replaced because no one's ripping the papers. Right. Can you believe this? Yeah. Now actually, we look back 2020, we're like, this is stupid. But back mm -hmm. then, and we're in the same exact situation now with AI. Right. Now sites are saying, oh, no one's going to need sites because of virtual trials, yep. which is equally as stupid, I think. I would agree. Right? What's the one resonating theme there? You should be prepared to embrace change. Thank you. Yeah. That's another. We're going to clip that for Patreon and charge $7 <laughs> for this one. You got, you got That's a, amazing. The nuggets. The nuggets <laughs> coming out. So, yes, I mean, change is inevitable. It's the only thing that's inevitable. Like, 2030 is going to be different than 2020 mm -hmm. in research. So, Simon, tell us about Deep Lens. Like, what, how did this come about? Sure. What was the pain point? Mm -hmm. And then, like, kind of guide us along the journey from inception. I know it's like a two and a half year old company yeah. until yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah, happy to, and thanks for having me today. Thanks so, for coming. Yeah, so Deep Lens is um, a company that was incorporated at the end of 2017, but we really didn't kick off until first quarter, second quarter of 2018, so it's a fairly new company. Um, the company came about um, as a result of a digital pathology platform that my co-founder, our CEO, Dave Billiter, had developed when he was the head of innovation at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, which is where the company is based. And um, Dave was able to license his old digital pathology platform at the time thinking, gee, you know, maybe this would be good to monetize through the, uh, the pathology industry. So TJ, our, our third co-founder, and Dave and I got together and we decided to start the company. But instead of going after a very small market, which was uh, the pathology industry, mm -hmm. where at the time it was under a billion dollars globally for hardware, software, and services, um, the, the guys who'd been working at Cardinal Health more recently had really been listening to what was going on in the industry and realizing that in clinical trial recruitment, the sponsors wanted to go further upstream. What that means is they wanted to see the patients much sooner. And so our thesis was hmm. that there is nothing more soon than the time of diagnosis, which is happening in the pathology lab, whether that happens with a regular microscope or through digital pathology. But if we can get at that data, get at that diagnosis, and then we can start the process to identify and then match a patient through the inclusion and exclusion criteria of a clinical trial, then we'd be able to um, make sure that those patients don't fall through the cracks. 
and especially don't get lost when there's that very narrow window of opportunity to actually put them on a clinical trial. I got you. So when you get the diagnosis, they're going to put you on standard of care mm -hmm. in most mm -hmm. cases. And then after that, maybe that six, eight, 12 weeks, then you have a narrow window before the next thing happens to get on that clinical trial. Well, the problem is if these um, cancer centers have thousands of patients coming through the doors, then to keep track of every patient that's come in in the last six or 12 months and know when their window of opportunity is about to happen, when all you're doing is managing this process with a spreadsheet, it becomes a big data problem that is temporal or time-based. And so it's really easy to miss patients. So we thought that if we made this software available to the cancer centers, to you know, the hospitals, the affiliates of the IDNs, and we made it free of charge, and they could use that to improve not only their own processes, so they're not using post-it notes and emails anymore, mm -hmm. they're using a really simple web-based tool. And we could um, then monetize that through the sponsors by improving the recruitment metrics that they have, that there could be a business there. So the model is sites, and, and right now your capabilities are anything on ecology, right? That's right, yeah, focus on oncology. Of course, clinical trials are across the board, um, but oncology is where the money is. Um, but also there's uh, a lot more of a pain point um, because in immuno-oncology, these precision-based trials that are going on, um, they're all competing for the same patient. And patients are not always getting that molecular test done when they should. So mm. um, helping um, not only ingest data from the lab systems and the EMR, but also the molecular testing labs like Caris, so who's Foundation, So who's all competing for the same patient? Who? The, so the sponsors are. So okay. um, yeah. you know, I heard a statistic recently at a conference that last year in all of cancer, um, 50,000 patients enrolled onto a clinical trial. Right now, just the immuno-oncology studies are looking for 600,000 patients. Holy wait, crap. wait, so last year, yeah, and the immuno-oncology is the only study we have for our CRO. That tells you how right. big this industry is. They're even mm -hmm. giving us the project. The, yep. But so last year, only 50,000 oncology patients in studies? Yeah, yeah. And, and so... That's yeah. low. That's so, low. But, but the, the, there are now something like 18,000 studies. There were only 5,000 eight years ago. So mm. that's exploded, and it's they're exploded. looking for a lot more patients as a result. So by default, those those studies cannot be successful because they're looking for way more patients than are available. And so what it, it becomes incumbent on the provider and the sponsor is to make sure that if a patient is eligible and wants to be on a study, that they can be enrolled onto that study. And right now, the industry in the US has stats of between 3 and 8% of patients who are eligible and want to be on a study that actually get enrolled. So the numbers are just wrong, the metrics are wrong. The systems don't really exist. Hmm. I don't care if it's a huge cancer center, it typically has a lot more resources and so they have better than normal um, systems. But the community hospitals, they just are literally using post-it notes, emails. Yeah. Some of them are updating a physical book once a month and there are these trial coordinators who are so busy with just referral business from oncologists they know that they don't even have time for pre-screening, let alone the tools to do it. Wow. So it's a big problem. It's a huge problem. <clears throat> are any, are, um, I guess there's enough business in oncology alone to have, <laughs> you know, like a very healthy company. Um, mm -hmm. Are sure. there any 600, plans? 600,000 patients. Yeah. Are there any plans to maybe go outside of oncology later? We get asked that all the time and we're open to doing it. But, you know, when you're starting a business, you've got to figure out what, um, what you should focus on and it's important to know what not to do. Mm. So although we're entertaining that, we're happy to test that out in a pilot, right now focusing on oncology, being successful, getting that escape velocity, mm. and then doing a lot more over time. That's the plan. Wow. Makes a lot of sense. So I guess it was very smart that you're going the, the free model for sites. Yep. Because now you can penetrate the tiniest clinics, mm -hmm. you know, and the big AMCs, academic medical centers. That's right. Um, and then the sponsors are still competing for these for these patients, mm -hmm. so they want the sites to be using. I mean, there's an incentive for them for the sites to use your technology, your tool, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's really interesting. The the provider um, not having to pay sees great value in this, and we're doing a lot of deals right now, not just for individual 
um, hospitals or cancer centres, but for entire IDNs. And they'll start with one or two or three and then want to take us through to the 50 of them. We're never having a pricing discussion with them. We just want to get access to the trial coordinators who are the users of our systems. The we study want coordinator. The, the study yeah. coordinator, CRC. We want um, the, the PIs, the oncologists, to be supportive and champions of this because it helps them. Mm. And by the way, if you're a PI running your own study, you may know a handful of oncologists who are looking for patients and that's where your referral business is going to come from. But what about mm. the other 90 oncologists at a big cancer center that you don't have interaction with? What about the patients they're seeing that would never find their way to your study unless you had a system to capture every patient and make sure that automatically they're stepped through that inclusion exclusion hmm. criteria and now everyone's being messaged in a workflow that makes sense and captures every patient for every study. So at the big AMCs, like let's take UCLA as an example, mm -hmm. okay. Um, what is their current system for, let's say they have cancer studies. Mm -hmm. Like, what are they, how are they getting the patients referred to whatever studies they have in house? Yeah, it's, it's really a who you know industry. So you'll find a lot of the sponsors will set up um, a site based on a previous relationship. And that doesn't even mean that they're the best site for that study. It just means that that's the site they know and they can get the site set up and hope mm -hmm. for the best. Mm -hmm. There's no data in that in the same way that really there's no data supporting that, that problem of the PI only knowing a handful of oncologists who should be right. on the lookout for his or her study. Even so, if they're all under the same roof. Like yeah, well, so, so take, take, um, take another UC that we're, we're talking to right now, 170 oncology studies. Each one of those has 20 or 30 inclusion and exclusion criteria. Hmm. And they have a dozen or so CRCs, trial coordinators. Well, now, put that over six or 12 months during the course of treatment for a patient, having to remember or know when that window of opportunity is evident, times thousands, times hundreds per month coming in, times 120 studies, <laughs> each of which has 20 or 30 or 40 inclusion exclusion criteria. And so times, it's just a big data problem that doesn't work. And times coordinators and many times PIs who don't really care. Right. If this patient goes here or goes to that study, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to them. Yeah. Um, we, we have one customer where the, the CRCs are just so busy, they're overwhelmed with the referral business. Hmm. Like a, a doctor who knew about this particular study, lucky, right. um, referred the patient. The CRC is now onboarding them, consent, enrollment, and then making sure they get through the trial and all of the paperwork that is required to do that. Um, that is a full-time job, and so screening is very rare there. So with our tool, they're able now to screen for every single patient that comes through the front door. They're able to make sure that that patient, if they are qualified for a specific trial, that they can at least be considered for that trial. We can't force the, the treating oncologist to actually put them on that trial, but we can say, here's a list of patients this week who've qualified completely mm -hmm. through the inclusion exclusion criteria. And then it's up to them to to make sure they're enrolled, but at least they're knowing that the patient is, um, it, th that the patients um, that can qualify are being presented. Wow. Yeah. So I'm unclear on a few items. Okay. Hopefully others who are watching this will be unclear That'll be too. That would be good for so. coordination. <laughs> Nobody's clear on this stuff. I'm really okay. bad at explaining things. Well, so. <laughs> well, first off, is this a software or a service? So it's, we're a software company, but we have a service component. So one of the... So with, think, the, with the freemium, yeah, I think is the terminology. Premium, yeah. yeah. So is that a software or a service? That I will tell you that um, the provider, cancer center, you know, academic medical center, they get access to the software for free. Mm -hmm. We will also place an individual there to be a coordinator of this to make sure the program is successful and that those trial coordinators are all trained up effectively yeah, to use this nice. going forward. And this is and all for we, free? We fund that. And that just shows you how much value there is to the sponsor. You foot the bill. We foot the wow. bill for that. Before you even get a sponsor. We've even been known to pay for some of the provider's expenses in getting it up and running. Wow. Because there's so much value in finding okay. those patients for the sponsors. People don't understand. The data is yeah. where it's all going to be like, this like decade. Google. It's, yeah, just look at other industries and see, okay, they're ahead. I mean, healthcare is always behind. Yeah. I always tell people we're at an advantage. 
Because you want to look at the future, look at other industries, and just replicate that here. Bingo. It's the same That's thing. That's what we did. That's exactly what we did. <laughs> when we started the company, we looked at other industries and we said, where is this particular problem set suffering the most and which other models could we take in order to be disruptive here? And I believe it is disruptive because other software companies are going in there Try selling something to a hospital, by the way, I've mm. been in that business and it's brutal. Because but selling free is easy, right? Easier. Selling free is easier, but it's no, there's no golden goose here because this is HIPAA cloud-based mm. software and it has to go through IT compliance review, etc. And we come out with flying colors, See. but um, it still takes time. So when you take the pricing off the table, it, it reduces a lot of the friction, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. it so when you, get, when you get a site to agree, let's say, a academic medical center yeah one that has a lot of studies right yeah so now do you get to know which sponsors are working with them does the site yeah. tell you or do you yeah. have to go it's on published. clinicaltrails.gov and find um, it? yeah we get it um, get we get it from a subscription to a global data we get it through the site and we can also look up on on ct.gov so now you have another now your sales process begins again with the sponsor. That's right. So right. now uh, we go in and say, here is some great free software and someone to make it work really well. And now we can see that there are 40 different sponsors who care about recruitment at that site. I see. And our I agreement with the, with the site is to say, you can run all of your studies on our software free of charge, but only if we get to talk to the sponsor. I gotcha. And then if a patient qualifies for a multiple study, let's say you have multiple sponsors at that site agreeing. Yeah. Yeah. Now a patient qualifies for multiple studies. Yeah. Or let's say one sponsor is not paying you yet. Okay. Yeah. And a patient qualifies for one that's paying you guys and one that's not. Yeah. Like you don't have anything to do with that? It's we don't. We're, we're really accelerating and improving an existing relationship between the site and the sponsor. Okay. But what we also do is we can bring sponsors to sites and they see a lot of value in that. But we're not playing God on I that see. decision. I That's see. really up to them. Okay, as mm -hmm. it should be. And yeah. then, so the sponsor is paying you like a monthly fee at this point. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so the sponsor gets a dashboard, and what's been uh -huh. really interesting for them, and, and we have one customer that's seen huge value in this, because previously they would go to a site and they would say, okay, how many patients do you have for me this month? And the, pay, and the provider would say, none, and that's the end of the conversation. Why Even not? Well, not sure. we didn't see any. Well, yeah. none were enrolled. Okay. How many did you see? Too busy, sorry. Now they can go to the site and say, <laughs> okay, of the 24 patients that were identified, nine made it all the way through the inclusion-exclusion criteria, yet you didn't enroll any. What happened to those nine, and can we take a look at them together? Mm. And it's just like, wow, having access it's to nice. that data yeah, is right. huge. For <laughs> yeah. yeah, That's where the value is, and sponsors are ready value. to pay for Oh, them. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and they'll pay for a subscription just to have access to that data, to but the then, dashboard. of course, they'll also pay a success fee. So any patient that gets enrolled as a result of running through our software, yeah. we, can get we can get paid as That's well. That's interesting because I monitor yeah. at an academic medical center uh, for oncology, actually. Oh, cool. So I could probably make some introductions for you guys uh, when I go there Friday. Yeah. Uh, but it's basically the same thing. Like sponsor has me ask the pi because i don't see anything right mm -hmm. i just see the papers they print yeah i don't see anything else so sponsor asked me hey you haven't enrolled in two months you know what's going on and now whatever the pi tells me i believe and i put in my report so yeah they say oh just no one's qualified yeah and that's it you know my job is done mm -hmm. and the sponsor is relying on me to be that dashboard basically that's right right yeah so now the sponsor actually can see mm -hmm. well actually you did have you did see patients this mm -hmm. week that qualified mm -hmm. but you didn't consent them what's going on and exactly. they can still say well that we did and the patient refused right but yeah. at least they have numbers now and by the way all of those reasons and all of the metadata are, are captured by our platform so it's a really easy to use web-based tool that the mm. trial coordinator uses and and they'll click buttons that um, say um, was uh, consented, not consented, if not, why not? And then we can aggregate all of that data and that I provides see. great insights too. I guess that brings up another issue though. So at these centers, I know the coordinators are so overworked, mm -hmm. right? So the last thing they want is another tool to use. Right. Mm -hmm. right, so is this like a passive tool that runs in the background or does it involve active input from the site? 
it's, it's automated because what we do is we use, we're an AI analytics company as well, and we haven't even talked much about that. We haven't we've talked, talked about, all about that. <laughs> we've talked about the workflow, we've talked about the human being that's in there actually making this work. But at the end of the day, um, what we're doing is we're taking the protocol for a clinical trial, which is a long word document, um, for lack of a better term, and we're breaking that down into discrete elements that get put into the engine and then each one of those can be triggered based on lab results that come in from lab, anything we learn that's updated in the EMR or the molecular testing results. So we can ingest um, molecular testing, genetic testing results automatically through an XML feed from the big labs or from your own internal labs if you're using an mm -hmm. Illumina box as an example. Um, that can happen automatically, but at the end of the day, it's a far superior and easier to use tool than physical books emailing spreadsheets or post-it notes and that's how it's really done these days so it's just a better tool. just to summarize it sounds as though with that dashboard the information goes to the sponsor mm -hmm. then the sponsor can turn around and call the site hey you have a patient you can screen I mean it yeah. worked that simply right so or the, on the spot on the site side mm -hmm. there's no need to look at the, anything well they, they do right? so the trial coordinators use it because they're they're tasked with finding patients and sure, enrolling sure, them but on the what study, I'm saying right? is the sponsor could take that role as well if the site is sometimes coordinators are way too busy to do anything yeah right so the, the sponsor yeah. could take that initiative that's true it can yeah. make a especially because reminder. we're for the first few months at least anyway we're putting a person on site and they could be the screening sure person for the entire hospital oh so that's you're possible. putting you guys deep lens is putting yeah. a, a personnel in in the oh site. yeah full time for months to make and sure you it's guys up are and putting running. this all this that's how much value there is. <laughs> That's how much value there is. No wonder you guys raised money. That's expensive. It's expensive, but there's it's, it's a lot of value there to the sponsor. And, sure, and as you pointed sure. it out before, how many sponsors are at one site? We can monetize to multiple sponsors. Especially at these AMCs. I mean, the totally, one you talked yeah. to, 170. Yeah. We're in very active dialogue on a daily basis with biotechs and big pharma because mm. they see a lot of value in this. So, mm. Mm. so. wow. There's a big problem out there in the inefficiency, and it doesn't seem like that's ever been tackled before. Right. And I think in this modern day and age, obviously with electronic medical records, that's a no-brainer, and everyone's been talking about that for a long time. But what's really prevalent now is in immuno-oncology, there are problems with making sure you get the right patients tested and when the test is done, meaning the, for the genetic mutation that mm. could be a, a match between the patient and the IO trial or the, um, or the actual commercial available drug, mm. um, that up until now those results were delivered as a PDF. And so there are companies out there that use natural language processing to try and scrape different reports. But those are now being made available as XML feeds that are machine readable and we can ingest those and make that searchable and then match automatically that patient with, as an example, a KRAS mutation to a specific drug or trial that's available for that mutation. And that's something that's wow. really hard to do with just a trial coordinator who may not be trained properly in genetic molecular testing. Yeah, absolutely. And I have a, excuse me, I have a prediction. And now CREs are gonna hate your company. I absolutely hate it. <laughs> They're going to put them out of business. I mean, they're going to CRAs. have a function in-house CRAs. In-house CRAs. Where, you know, the ones that are always calling, hey, um, how many people are going to screen this sure, week? How many sure. people do you have potentially? Maybe not. Maybe you're making them busier, actually. Sponsor depends, has again, the dashboard. Again, embracing, yeah. Right? Embrace the tech. Sponsor has well, the dashboard depends, right? and they say, hey, use in-house CRAs. But you, you, don't need, make more calls. you don't need in-house CRAs assigned to each site, right? You can have just one just person one. Yeah. reviewing that data. Right. right and making right. the calls. I, I think from what we've seen, there are there's more work to be done than there are people available. Yes. And AI, if you know anything about AI, and you read every single article, talks about it being an assistant, not a replacement. And that's right. And and people who feel threatened by technology or artificial intelligence um, may may be replaced in 10 or 20 years. But really, it's just a way to assist. Like we started by doing machine vision, deep learning in the digital pathology image. And so we can take a blown up slide of a, of a tumor and we can identify or classify a tumor as mm -hmm. accurate as a trained pathologist. Hmm. Wow. Sitting at home drinking his or her coffee with a lot of time to do it and yeah. we're just as accurate 
And in a work environment where they're doing 50 a day, we're more accurate. Now, mm. you could argue that a pathologist is going to be replaced. Well, they're not. They should, they should use technology, AI, to do the boring stuff that mm -hmm. is below their pay grade so they can get onto the high value stuff of the true diagnosis. Sure. And I think that in the trial um, recruitment business, it's the same thing. They oh, should absolutely. just allow the tech to take care of the boring, banal stuff mm -hmm. that the takes too much time. And then, but the sales, and like we said in Patreon, I'm gonna keep plugging that Patreon channel. Um, Some books the, now. The storytelling. Yeah, right. That's that's right. always gonna be human. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna listen to a story from a machine, at yeah. least not in our lifetimes. Yeah. Right. But uh, the the mundane stuff, like identifying patients, going through thousands of EMRs to find the hundred patients that may be qualified, now having a human get involved, see if which ones of those hundred actually do, and then having a conversation with those. Bingo. Right? So how about, how about the human touch required to sit down with the patient or with the oncologist and say, look, we really believe this is a good fit for this patient. That sometimes never gets done. We hear horror stories of patients who are delivered on a silver platter to mm. the provider and the call never happens. You see? I keep saying soft skills are going to be the future totally of this industry. Right. Yeah. Because the hard skills, all that stuff, is going to go to a machine. It's, yeah. a, it's e easy to be busy, but you know, the yeah, human People are laughing at me so now for important. saying this. On yeah. LinkedIn, they're laughing. So rude. You won't be laughing in 2030. I tell you that. You better get some <laughs> empathy. Yeah. All right? Yeah. This was fascinating. What do, do you have follow up I questions? I do. Chris? It's totally <laughs> off on a tangent, but those are good. I I do definitely disagree with the AI part. You said that people maybe unnecessarily are fearful of AI. Mm -hmm. The current version of AI, I would agree with, that's unnecessary. But when we get to true AI, I think there's well, a we'll need be for fear. We'll be dead. This is not true <laughs> AI. Right. We won't care anymore that we said that. <laughs> this is not yet true AI, right? It's not. It's not learning as it's processed. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, I think they, they talk about AI allowing us to get to the point where they, everyone's working really hard now so they can just enjoy life later on. And, right. Um, and maybe it allows you to do it. Just get a thousand bucks a month from, uh, what was that guy, Yang? Just, Andrew Yang? Going to give you a yeah. thousand bucks a month. That's mm -hmm. right. Let the machines do the work. Live on the beach. And, <laughs> Here at Los Olivos, let's uh, go in the pool. <laughs> Interesting stuff, guys. Uh, I mean, it, you have to understand this stuff. If you're in the, I don't care what aspect of clinical research you're in this is the future it's here it's not coming it's already here mm -hmm. sure right so thank you very much simon if people want to get a hold of simon um should i send them to your linkedin yeah or LinkedIn's what's fine. the website do so you prefer website, anything like, i you know personally linkedin is simon arkel um it's linkedin slash simon arkel i'll put links underneath yep. yeah and then the website is deeplens.ai Okay, deep lens and that explains AI. pretty deeply what we do from the technology to the business problem we're trying to solve. I love it's it. It's a good pretty time to be doing this. Yeah, we've yeah. got some big VCs behind us who believe in the story. So Simon, uh, I'm going to put links to his LinkedIn in the show notes, also the website, which is? So the website is deeplens.ai, which has uh, got everything we do from the tech to the business problem we're trying to solve. Perfect. And my LinkedIn is uh, Simon Arkell. Links to both, to deeplens.ai and to Simon Arkell's LinkedIn. He's like, obviously, I mean, you want to pick his brain, like get on LinkedIn. You're going to have a lot of people messaging you now. <laughs> Hopefully, let's see what happens. Uh, if you're a site or academic institution in oncology, you need to talk to him. It's free. you got nothing to lose. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Do they have yeah. anything to lose? They At all? Nothing to lose. They get two free ones for the price of one, which is free. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Very nice. All right, good. So they, because a lot of sites are worried, hey, we're going to lose our data to you. No. They, that's not the case. We're acceler accelerating existing relationships between the site and the sponsor, but we can also bring new sponsor opportunities to the site because we're you. having those conversations all the I time. Gotcha. So anything in oncology, hit up so Simon. We're essentially recruiting for sites new studies. Yeah, exactly. Right. Very nice. Yeah. There's, and there's revenue in them. Yeah, in that for absolutely. Them too. Mm. Perfect. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you for having Thank me. You, it's Chris. been fun. Thank you, everybody, Thanks. for watching and listening. Catch you all later. Bye-bye.